master's again, I think, um, in uh, arts management and administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of thing. Uh, from the uh, Claremont Graduate University. Um, and this, uh, I don't know how, this is a survey show that I don't know that you've surveyed all of this work together mm -hmm. before. So we have that on as well as presenting um, an in-depth project that Justin has been working on for some six years all together here um, in the gallery. So uh, I will bring Jessica with no further ado. Welcome, thank you for coming, and please welcome Jessica Lim. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? I'm gonna hold it because I. The, okay. All right. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Right on. Um, that humming that you're hearing, that's from my video, and it's really weird because I'm humming, and I'll get the sound of my own hum in my head. So I have like a meta humming that's constantly going on in my mind. And when you're making video and you're doing editing. Like you're spending a lot of time like looking at images and listening. So it is really weird. I've had that ongoing hum uh, in my mind, I think, for the last two months. So um, I'll find myself humming it and I'm like, get out of my mind. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for being here. It's been so wonderful thus far. Um, being here on campus, talking with the classes, everyone has been so wonderful. I feel like it's been a real sense of communing that has been taking place on campus. And I just want to express to you all how important it is to have that sense of communing and that art has the power to do that. It has the power to bring people together on the campus. It creates a beautiful third space in which there can be dialogue, in which there can be safety, in which different perspectives can be celebrated and shared. And so I really just want to congratulate and give a round of applause to Pam and Vivian for putting all of this together. It makes such a huge difference. Um, and having that type of support as an artist is huge. Um, this is the first time I'm seeing all of this stuff together and you could imagine it's a lot um, and I'm gonna be throwing a lot more images at you so you'll see the kind of world that I'm living in in my mind in terms of the saturation of imagery and um, what I'm working with. But first I'm gonna introduce you to some important people. This is my uh, mom and my dad. I love this image of them. It's super iconic for me. I love my dad's fro. We have the same fro. Um, the butterfly collar, I mean, it's amazing. And uh, my parents remind me of Princess Leia and Shaft. And um, in terms of thinking about what are the different popular culture images you're consuming, thinking about your own family, thinking about ways you're pulling different kind of relationships and making different connotations, I love having this image together because it really speaks to my dorkiness um, with Star Wars, of course, and loving sci-fi, but also kind of consuming black media culture in terms of thinking black exploitation um, and different popular cultural representations. My parents owned um, an advertising agency called the Wimbley Group. And so this idea of creating um, different representations in media is something it, that is very much a part of my experience growing up. They owned in the 90s the, lar the eighth largest black owned ad agency in the US and did a lot of advertising with Fortune 500 companies that did targeted marketing that um, focused on the urban market and minorities. And so as a result, many of their um, advertisements, um, they did commercials, print ad, um, radio, etc., ended up in publications such as Ebony and Jet. How many here are familiar with Ebony and Jet magazine? 
Okay, so you have a number who are familiar and a number who aren't. For those of you who are not familiar with um, Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine, um, they are magazines that come from a publishing company called Johnson Publishing. Um, they were a very important um, media outlet for the black community. Um, they started around the 1930s, 40s, and you have to consider that when they started, it was during a time period where their media was segregated. You did not have these kind of integrative um, platforms in which different perspectives are being shared and you're having access to like black culture in a larger media context. You had to have your own separate outlets, your own separate production, your own separate distribution. So when you think of Johnson Publishing and the fact that it was started in the 30s and the 40s, um, this is something that's really significant in terms of um, archiving and, cap and capturing black American culture for a real extended amount of time. I mean, imagine this idea of images from the civil rights era that were being produced and documented and distributed within the black community that um, this publicate, Johnson publication was able to capture. Um, so it's a really important part of our history. And um, you're lucky being here in Southern California because the Getty now um, holds many of the, uh, much of the archive from Johnson Publishing, which features Jet and Ebony Magazine. So Jet was something that was um, influential to me. Um, in my video, you're gonna see images of Urkel. I'm so there for black nerdiness. I consider myself a dork. I'm, I just accept it. Um, and I love the representation of Urkel in terms of this popular cultural representation of blackness in a way that wasn't um, necessarily the typical representation. Um, and so with Ebony, again, having different focuses on issues and content and representations of things from the black culture, you also had representations of beauties of the week. And this is what the format of like the beauty of the week looked like. You had some beautiful woman in a bikini and you have a little bit of information about her and what's important and all of that. And um, it really kind of communicates this idea of like, what's this idea of beauty within the black community? What's kind of respectability within the black community? community, what are, what's aspirational, what are you trying to strive for? Um, so that was something that was really important. When I look at images of Ruby Bridges and I think of kind of media content and things that we're consuming, um, I connect with it in a very personal way. For those of you who are not familiar, she was a little girl who was integrating the school system. And so you had this powerful little black girl um, doing the psychological work of having to exist in violent, toxic white spaces that resented her being there. And so when I see a little brown girl with an afro, I, I, you know, doing that type of work, um, and you see it in Norman Rockwell, um, represented in Norman Rockwell's painting, um, Ruby as well. Well, it reminds me um, of my experience growing up in an all-white community and being one of very few people who were in my school system and, um, and oftentimes in some places becoming the first in spaces. Um, thinking about this imagery, this is one of the first photographs I actually took. And this is a black and white film photo that I took. Um, on a trip that I went to when I was in high school um, to go to Ghana. And so I was in Accra and I was staying with Bishop Duncan Williams, who is a black preacher who's part of a mega church that was in Ghana and that then actually ended up relocating to the United States. And I took this picture while I was at church there. Um, and I was really fascinated with the viewpoint of the little girls. And what I found so amazing was how much it related to kind of the representation of Ruby. And it looks like some, a picture that could have been taken in the 60s, but that was actually in the late 90s. 
I'm also interested in um, different representations of black women, and especially um, women in Africa and indigenous women. Um, we had this book in my house called African Adorned, and I love the different representations of black women. You saw black women who are nude, but they weren't hypersexualized. That was like their natural way of being. They had dope bling on that like I personally really connected with and incorporated into my own aesthetic. And I felt like it gave me different um, aesthetics and ways of thinking about myself and um, how I could relate to my own sense of kind of beauty and blackness and womanhood. So here what you're seeing is an image of a Shirley card. Have you, any of you heard of, of a Shirley card before? Okay, I'm gonna kick some film history to you right now. So a Shirley card was something that was used to um, balance color um, in your camera, so choosing what the right aperture would be based on skin tones. And this was used with Kodak, and it was for the consideration of taking colored photos. And what the Shirley card represents, and you can think of this as Shirley, is that that balancing color and basing color and how you would take the photos was based on white skin tones. And so when you have representations of black people in photography, they're using these standards that are based on a very specific and limited range of skin tones that did not effectively represent the diversity of a vast range of skin tones that are not just Shirley's color. And so here they talk about the negatives and the process um, going into how you go about setting um, the color range. And you have some um, artists who are addressing this idea of the white woman being normalized as how you determine how to take a picture. That white skin tone was used as the base to normalize how to represent photography. And so you have different artists who are really thinking about this idea of skin tone and pushing that idea further where whiteness or light skin tone is just not the norm or the centralized skin tone to consider. This is work by Byron Kim. Um, he do, does these really amazing pieces where he's breaking down and kind of pixelating some skin tones that you're seeing to be more representative of the actual skin tones that people are versus the solitary kind of representations of this idea of flesh um, color that I don't even know whose flesh it's supposed to represent. So he looks at nuances in terms of what's in your um, palm of your hand, different skin tones, etc. And then you have artists like Angelica Das, who actually um, goes and photographs different people and takes really close up pictures of their skin and then uses um, the pixel that they get from their color of their skin to determine what their color would be in paint. And so these are Panatone colors that she's creating based on the different people who are modeling for her based on a vast range of skin tones. And within her work as an artist and a photographer, she's um, talking about this vast range that's not being represented and articulated and pulling from life and from examples from the variety of human skin tones that we have to develop this um, new system and consideration for color. Another artist that um, I'm interested in, in terms of thinking about photography, thinking about relationships to pixelation and so on, um, and breaking down the, grid, um, the image is Charles Gaines. Um, within this piece, you move from photography and then you move to kind of this breakdown and pixelation of the image. And that's something in terms of process, I like to go back and forth in my own work. Um, and you have other artists dealing with ideas of pixelation in um, their work that I've also incorporated in my work when I start doing photography and working with um, digital collage and media. So these are some sensibilities that I'm thinking about and some artists that I'm looking at and thinking about as I'm creating some of my different works. Um, I also look at um, Rudd Van Empel is another um, artist um, who was working with Photoshop and creating these different portraits um, of people. And all of these people are actually, um, it's composited. So it's not like this little boy exists in real life. This is a composite of an image that he was um, able to create. 
of um, children in these different environments. And he, built, he has built archives of different images, whether it be foliage, um, landscapes, people, fabric, et cetera, that he'll scan in, um, cut and collage, and then work with um, in Photoshop to create these interesting environments. His work reminds me a lot of Carrie James Marshall's paintings in terms of how um, the, the use of kind of the blackness in the skin and how some of the figures are represented. And in this Lost Boys series, I really loved how he was rendering um, portraits and using the idea of dark skin tones. And so that helped me think about how in making my own work, how I can work on the surface of an image, in particular images that I'm working in in Photoshop and printing out. Um, how can I address it as a painting? Um, what are some different approaches that I can use to deal with it painterly? Um, I, in this particular uh, piece, Octavia's, Octavia's History One, um, I worked on the surface with uh, graphite and charcoal, and it's one of the first pieces that I started to actually go in and um, physically work on top of the surface. And this is a part of the same series where I'm actually doing the collage and starting to work on top of the surface for the first time. Um, Carrie James Marshall was also really interested in looking at um, black life and kind of documenting the ordinary of what's happening within black life to include it into the kind of history of the grand narrative history painting because that's been something that has been excluded from um, art history. And so I love the idea of how he was creating and documenting this idea of the everyday. And then Barclay L. Hendricks, uh, another painter that I love, does these amazing portraits. Um, if you get a chance to go up to Northern California, they have um, Soul of a Nation on view, in which they have some of Barclay L. Hendricks, this actual piece on view. Um, and so you have these beautiful representations that he's doing of um, black people in spaces, fashion, speaking to the time period. And so, of course, um, me being who I am, I have a lot of ideas and questions when I'm looking at these different works and when I'm making work that come into mind. And so here you're seeing um, an image of DNA. So Audre Lorde is someone who's really important to me. Uh, that brings forth a really important ideas. And I have a quote here. If I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. And I thought that was such a powerful quote because how, mo how important is it for you to have your own kind of self-determination and some control and how you're perceiving and creating your own identity? How are you using language to identify yourself and think about yourself um, as a human being? Um, and so in terms of thinking about this idea of identity and um, how we can think about ourselves, I go to this idea of intersectionality. Um, and intersectionality, um, this is um, a term from Kimberly Crenshaw, and it really looks at um, identity in terms of the access of intersections. How does, um, you can't separate being a black woman and separate the race from the gender, that these two identities are part of who I am and a form how I experience the world. Um, and Kimberly Crenshaw was particularly looking at this notion in term in a lens of social justice because she was a lawyer and she was look or she's a lawyer, she's an attorney and she's looking at how discrimination um, can impact people across different lines of their identity. And so when we're thinking about how discrimination takes place, looking at how people's different identities are existing, multiple identities existing within the same body. So that's something that's important to me when I'm making my work, thinking about these ideas of intersectionality. And getting back to um, Audre Lorde, um, as a result, um, she, she's somebody who is also a champion of intersectionality and thought about it a lot in terms of her activism and her poetry. And she came up with the term biomythography um, related to one of her books that she wrote called Zamni, A New Spelling of My Name. 
Biomythography um, is a combination of biography, history, and myth. And when I heard that term, I was like, oh my gosh, I think this woman just came up with the word that I needed to describe what I'm trying to do within my art practice. Because often as an artist, you're working and you're developing a visual language. And then you have to come up with a textual language to talk about what it is that you're doing. And sometimes you could be so focused in the process and the making, you have no idea how the hell to explain what you just did. You're just like, I just made this thing. Is, isn't that enough? And sometimes you have to come up with language to describe and context um, to describe in a framework to describe what it is you're doing. Um, and I thought biomythography was great. And so that's something that not only I've incorporated and thought about in terms of thinking about my own practice, but a lens that I use in terms of a framework that I create for a curatorial practice that I do with my husband, Chris Christian. So investigating biography as an interdisciplinary arts practice. So I'm not only looking at how I'm making my work, but I'm also look at how different artists are using biomythography within their own arts practice. And they have a safe place to kind of have framework to get into deeper discussions about the content and ideas in their work in a way that makes sense. So they can be free to just make it. There's already a framework. So now you can be free, make it. You don't have to worry about the language. So here's my mother, um, in terms of going now back to the um, personal and my own family history. Uh, my mother had written a book and it was part, uh, or it was, has a chapter in a book that um, focuses on her history of, and the history of my grandparents actually. Um, my mom um, was born in Germany. Her mother was a German woman um, living in Germany during World War II. And my grandfather was an American soldier who was fighting in the war. And they met over in Germany, married, and my mom was born over there. And um, looking at family history, um, is something that has been very important to my mother. It's something that um, she works very hard on. She shares with um, me and my family, and we've gone on different trips, um, looking at our heritage and our history. But um, being part of um, the Afro-Deutsche community has been something that has been so important in terms to my mother's identity, my identity, and what her experiences have been kind of being a part of this post-World War II um, generation. Um, part of this makes me think about what was going on during that time frame a little bit before World War II um, in Vermeer, Germany, um, which is a time that my grandmother would be doing her thing. And there was some stuff that was quite revolutionary um, that was happening in Germany. It was progressive for a minute. Um, and women had um, a lot of um, agency and were kind of pushing their way of expressing their feminism. And so you kind of had this golden age in which women were subjects. Um, and in this particular image, it was really controversial at the time, thinking that was happening, you know, it was made in the um, 1920s, 30s, where you have a woman with short hair all of a sudden she's showing her legs, she's smoking a cigarette, she's drinking, she's reading a book. She's, yeah, she's real modern, right? She's getting her life. So I loved the representation of now you had women who are no longer relegated just to the domestic sphere. They're out there being um, seen in public. They're showing different parts of their body. They're engaging in intellectual discourse. They're hanging with the, like a man would, having a cigarette, having a drink, wearing a monocle. They don't have to have long hair. I love this image. Y'all are gonna see me do something with that later in the future. But I love how within this time frame, you really had women kind of pushing the boundaries of how gender is represented. So you had a lot more masculine representations um, that are expanded into how women could be represented. The spectrum of femininity has just been expanded. And so I thought that was something that was really interesting. You also had kind of Dada that was happening at the time in, um, 
Berlin and you had a lot of weird collage that was going on. And Hannah Hawk was a woman who was well known for doing a lot of collage works where she was pulling actually from popular culture and magazines that were produced in Germany. So as you can see, um, she's pulling different images, she's playing with scale, she's playing with proportion, um, she's playing with the human figure. And of course, looking around the room, you can tell that I really got into how she was doing collage and that was a big influence um, within my work and how I'm thinking about um, making work. I'm also a sci-fi nerd and I love Octavia Butler. Um, have any of you read Octavia Butler before? Yeah, so all of you are feeling my, I see you in the back there. All of it, like I'm there with you feeling the nerdiness of Octavia. Octavia Butler is a science fiction writer and essentially she's like, I don't see myself in science fiction, so I'm gonna write myself in. And so every time I read her, you know, here she is this dark skinned black woman with a short fro and like those are like the heroines and I'm like, I am this woman, I am Octavia Butler. Um, so I really love all of her writings, all these different books, you need to read it. Um, it you're, you're irresponsible if you don't. They actually made a, a opera based off of uh, Parable of the Sours that will be um, featured I think next week. So I'm just like, oh my gosh, I hope I can make it back out there for that. But I'm such a nerd. Octavia Butler signed my book and told me to persist. And I'm like, okay, if Octavia told me to, this needs to happen. And I also need to make that a tattoo. Um, I'm also interested in um, thinking about identity, not just from kind of familial um, relationships, but genetic relationships. What's genetic identity in a time now that we could do DNA sequencing? And so this is an example of uh, my actual uh, uh, results from my DNA test um, from Natural Geographic. And I always find it funny because my route out of Africa is like a big question mark, um, which I'm like, of course, of course. Um, but I'm interested in kind of the stories embedded within genetic information because that's another layer of identity um, now that we have access to. And then there's 23andMe. And, you know, it's really interesting, the, the, the again, narratives that um, family members can tell you being uh, mirrored within your genetic information. Um, one thing my uh, mom and my family has always told me is that um, on my dad's side, we were descended from slaves. Um, however, um, she said that apparently we weren't treated as badly. And I'm like, well, how would you know if you weren't treated as badly, you know, during the content? Like, what does that even mean? And for me, I was thinking, well, okay, my mom's half white, so that would make me a quarter. So if there was a history of rape um, that like became genetically available, you'd be able to trace that because I'd have more white in me if that was the case. And so I found it interesting because I'm like, hmm, does that, is that supporting the, is my genetics supporting the narrative that my parents told me that maybe like there wasn't, you're not seeing a trace at least uh, genetically of systematic rape that would have more white in my bloodline if at least if that, the, if that was the case. It's not to say that rape didn't happen, but at least kids and multi-generations weren't produced from it. So I thought that was something that was really interesting. But even still, there, if I go to a different kind of uh, setting for 23andMe, I can become a white person. And I'm like, the science isn't quite right on this at all. <laughs> um, and then there's like this 1.2%. I have like different percentages that end up being unassigned. And I'm like, I guess that's the part of me that's artist. <laughs> So I'm also interested, so thinking about kind of that microscopic le level, thinking about genetics and whatnot, um, I'm also interested in different representations of identity in melanin. And so here you have a microscopic image of melanin, and this is the image that I'm pulling, as you can see, from that's embedded in all um, all these works here. And melanin, of course, being what determines your eye color, your skin color, your hair color, is something that's important in terms of how it shapes our identity and how we kind of operate through the world. 
And I also think of, again, going to the genetic, the, the microscopic level, thinking of stem cells. It's kind of like woman magic because it's like, I, I go and talk to Octavia Butler land. And again, for those of you who are there, wild seed. Um, in terms of thinking about stem cells and different genetic information and the ability to create new life and being awesome, being a woman and all this other stuff. And this brings it to kind of a universal space. Like what does this mean in the context of being alive, being human beings, um, our, our footprint in the world and how it relates on a galactic level, um, whether it be um, thinking about the creation of the universe or even looking at constellations and thinking about our place in the world, our time, our space, and also how we use constellations and whatnot as a way to map our ways or travel throughout um, the world. Another element that you're um, seeing in my work is stereo, um, using some stereographs um, format. Um, stereographs were produced between 1840s and 1920s. They were a revolutionary uh, form of entertainment during that time period. Think of like a uh, 19th century form of like VR. Like it was like 3D and amazing to people. So you had these cards where you had images that were a little differentiation side by side that you then looked through this viewfinder and then it created this 3D um, effect. And so it allowed people to travel to different places and see things and be instructional in ways that you weren't necessarily able to before. I thought this image was crazy and I'm like, yes, I need this in my life. Um, the free lunch bit. And then this, this, was, this is part of uh, how to be a US citizen series. And I'm like, really, how to tie a shoe? Um, and so there is, very, there is very much instruction that was a part of um, the stereographs. And so the yellow that you're seeing in the back of um, these works, I'm actually using the back of the stereograph and I'm turning it vertical and using that as kind of a ground as a starting place for the work. Here you have an image of a cabinet card in which you're seeing um, some beautiful indigenous people, um, very much interested in cabinet cards, if you couldn't tell. Um, and because I, I'm interested in this idea of how these early photography was creating this sense of um, identity. And so in looking at um, the stereography of similar images, I would um, take these images and then I would start creating these kind of new and different narratives. So going back to this idea of melanin as a resource, um, now you're actually starting to see, you're, you might be able to see some of the people who are um, embedded into these works here. This is a great, great grandparent. Um, and my mom is like the holder of all these kind of images. So I go to my mother and I'm like, hey, do we have images of like relatives you could give to me? Um, and so I start incorporating and making portraits based on merging different images with um, different family members, but also different um, cabinet cards and representations that I um, have found. Within this particular um, image, this image is called Belle, and I used her as a placeholder for um, family members in um, parts of my an ancestry where I have no visual representation. It's present genetically. I've heard stories um, from family and whatnot. Um, but I don't have a lot of pictures. So I decided to use her and her, and that the image of her was called Belle. Hence, um, with this work, it, it's a continu continuation using images to create portraiture with her where you have space and the melanin incorporated. And um, this is from the series Belle series. And here's another great grandparent. And here's a close up where I start merging these different images and incorporating them. And here are some of my family members here in Germany, and they're incorporated with other family members. Um, 
And so the, hence the title that you get with this series here, Bell Jet. It's a continuation of thinking about the Bell Beautiful Women series, but then I'm incor incorporating images from Jet as well. For some of you who I've, um, some of you have come who I've spoke with you in class, I talked about the Mirror of Race website where they had um, early cabinet cards where they're representing people of color. Um, I thought this was a really amazing source of information. You have like this beautiful kind of like trans from going from like indigenous to kind of like assimilated within the same picture plane, which I thought was a very interesting way to kind of represent um, their portrait and to talk about identity and, um, and uh, uh, identity making and history. And so again, this idea of people being able to start crafting their own kind of sensibilities and sense of self and representations. And the inclusion of hair was something that was also done within the portraitures um, and, and some of those portraitures at the time. This particular image was striking to me because I was like, whose hair is that? Um, and, and, and what does it, it say about the people and how does it impact the image? It's another bit of information. It's genetic information now. And so that's something that I started to incorporate in the work. I was incorporating my own hair um, where it's like a double portraiture where if you were to pull one of the hairs and do a genetic test, you'd get like a Jessica. Um, so then um, you have an interesting kind of representation that's there. So here's an example of one of my uh, early cards that I worked on um, and where I incorporated my own hair and was doing collage. And this one um, was interesting for me because it reminded me of my mom. Um, and so there, there's an image of my mom. Then there's this like collage of this cabinet card. And I was like, oh snap, I can like make my own family members um, pulling from these different sources. But it also talks about how we kind of perceive and experience race and how that, those features can shift along timelines, within generations, along history, and that you can have a wide range of features that exist. This is my German side of the family. And so when you start looking at these cabinet cards where they include white people, I'm like, those things aren't mutually exclusive in terms of not only my familial history, but like my pictorial cultural history. Like the black exists alongside with this representation. So when I look at old um, different cards, I don't feel that it's necessarily something separate from me. And I can see myself and my family represented. Uh, I had a little afro ever since I was a little girl. Um, quite cute. Um, so I'm also looking at um, part of the images I was able to pull from was ebony. And they had this amazing, um, I got this amazing edition where they had uh, uh, beauty queens from uh, black colleges. And I was like, oh my goodness, the portraiture is amazing. I love this. Let's see how we can kind of engage the two. And then also thinking of the beauties of the week. And I start incorporating these different images um, together, um, coming through the different space, being ripped through and tearing and um, also carving into the pictures and pulling kind of different relationships. You see the Ruby Bridge kind of image relating back again to kind of the cabinet card that I went and worked the surface and etched out and really kind of working with the dimension. And so you start seeing some of the images that I'm starting to pull from. Where is she? Right there. Um, so you could see within this piece here, part of the bikini, that is the actual beauty of the week that I was pulling from. I'm also pulling images of um, Sarah Bartman, who was a woman who was actually put on display and fetishized and violently abused. Um, from who, a woman who was from South Africa and came to Europe and ended up being a part of kind of the World's Fair and put on display. And even after she passed away, they took her body and had it on display. So that's her deceased body um, on display. So there's this real kind of um, exploitation that's happening there 
but I also integrate her and kind of her story and her physique within the representation of the black female body and the beauty of the weak. And again, I work on the surfaces of these using um, acrylic, or not acrylic, um, pastels, graphite, powdered pigment, uh, spray paint. What else is up on here? Um, whatever is at my disposal. Um, you're seeing me use actually pastel pencils um, to work in the surface of that and highlight different details. And so here you're seeing me actually work on this series of work when I was on residency at University of Laverne. And that brings us to where we are in the gallery now, um, in which you get to see all of this work where I'm incorporating hair, I'm doing the collage, I'm pulling from these different environments, I'm working on the surface, um, a lot of ideas I'm pulling um, together within this work, but the core idea is being that you can have multiple identities existing within a singular um, body, that you can have an identity that's intersectional, um, that you can have a rich history, um, that you can tell about um, yourself or your family in interesting ways and relate it to other people, and um, that you can challenge ideas in ways that identity is created and represented within the work. So, thank you. If you have any questions. Hi. Hello. I'm Adisa. I'm so excited. I, I just walked in by chance and saw your work at the beginning of the semester. I was oh. like, I'm coming to the talk, so I'm here. Right on. Thank you. And I appreciate everything you shared with us. I'm curious about what the, what is a cabinet card? If you could maybe define that, and also like where did that where how did you where did that come from? How did you discover that? Um, I discovered cabinet cards researching um, photography, looking at stereographs and kind of looking at for processes of photography that were happening kind of sequentially historically. And um, I came across cabinet cards like physically um, at an antique store. And so I actually build an archive and collect these materials going to eBay, going to antique shops, going to antique fairs, going to flea markets. So there's very much an element of shopping that's involved um, in collecting and dealing and creating this kind of vast archive and then kind of spreading it out and looking at these and seeing how, how they're in relationship with like the ebony magazines that I'm collecting and seeing how the different portraits are in conversation with each other. So I essentially build an archive of these things, look at them for a really long time and see like how they're in conversation and I just go ham and start collaging and playing with them. But um, cabinet cards, early form of uh, portrait photography happening in the late 1900s. And again, it's one of the first forms of portraiture that becomes more democratized. Before it was like wealthy people had paintings done and only the important people had their portraits done. Um, with cabinet cards, it became one of the ways that people started um, creating their identity because all of a sudden they could represent themselves in a different way. And they were in a smaller size so you can like hand them out. So there's a sense of objecthood to them. And you turn around the back of them and they have different information. So if you look over in the corner there, I don't know many of you if you can see that Negro stamp that's on there, that's actually a literal back of a cabinet card. And so there's information and history that's embedded in the back of the card as well. So there's a lot going on with it as an object and you have to consider it dimensionally, which is one of the reasons why I like to rip into it and do these different things to tell and bring forth different stories that can be on top of or beneath or behind it. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of just cut it as you go, or do you have like... No, I'm, and it's super weird and creepy, I know, but um, 
I, I, you know, when I'm combing my hair and I have my hair like in my pick, I like collect it. And some, you know, there's been times where I've had like little fro balls around and I'm like telling my husband, don't throw it away, it's important. It's really important for my work. He's like, okay, you know? And so I, I and when I get my hair cut, I'll like save the hair. But literally yesterday I'm staying with one of my friends and she had a hairbrush and it was all full. And, I was eyeing it, and I'm like, ooh, I see materials now. And then I'm like, how do I ask this question of like, could I have your hair? It's kind of creepy. Um, but she's an artist as well, and she was like, of course you could have my hair. And I'm like, yay. So she's sending me um, our hair. Yeah, but yeah, I collect my own hair. Other questions? Don't be scared. Mm -hmm. Oh, great question. Did everyone hear that? How does literature and prose influence my work since I'm looking at Audre Lorde and Octavia Butler and I pulled this quote? Oh my goodness, it goes back to that notion of language. How, how do I use language to help articulate um, what's in the work? How can it further push my own work? It, it's different types, of, being able to expand different types of languages and tell stories in different formats is something that's really powerful and um, helps inform how I'm thinking about it, how I'm talking about it, how I can do world building and consider, um, especially when I'm thinking about things like Octavia Butler, where it's like she's building a whole sci-fi you know, sci world and is doing legit world building and building this mythology, which is amazing. How do I do that as an artist? Um, and how do I articulate that? How am I creating a visual type of language as an artist? And then how do I explain that verbally or textually? So looking at prose and thinking about prose, it's a really great kind of back and forth that can help inform one another. Mm -hmm. That is like a dream. I would love to both uh, do a project with my work in Germany and then also do an Afro-Deutsche biomythography. Um, like that, that's a fantasy for me. I'm like, oh my gosh, that needs to happen. But um, the Afro-Deutsche community, it's really interesting and especially considering my mother's generation because many of those children were um, forced into orphanages or given up for adoption. And I'm to the point where my mother doesn't even know, we don't even know black people, biracial people from her generation who weren't adopted or given up. So the fact that my grandparents were able to stay together and the family was able to stay together and then immigrate to the US is a really significant part of the story and that's why when she wrote you know included the family that chapter of the family story in the book it was so significant because people are like we haven't heard this and to take it to the next level my grandmother um already had a daughter she was married before and she was married to a white german soldier and so they took her her in-laws took her um, and wouldn't allow her to immigrate. And it was rare that you heard a story that the white child wasn't able to come, but the like interracial family was able to stay together. So yeah, that's right for work right there. Mm -hmm. oh, I was gonna ask, like, is the rest of your family really artistic or is it like, you happen to be? <laughs> um, I mean, I think they're definitely artistic in different ways, having an advertising agency and kind of working with media. Um, I definitely think there's some creativity there. My sister's an English professor, um, so she's somebody that I go to for like, you know, thinking about the language and the, the verbal. She was actually the one who was like, you should look at Audre Lorde. And I was like, oh my God, that was amazing. So there's a really nice kind of exchange intellectually um, that we have, um, you know, my, my mom has written a chapter, my mom, my sister's done it, you know, she's published, so it's like, they have a strong writing background. Um, it's kind of intimidating, I'm like, ooh, um, I don't know if I want you to read any of my stuff, well, no pressure. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's definitely ways that people in my family are creative, but I'm like, of course, the one who went to art school and is kind of nerdy and weird and, you know, the weird one in the family in that way. Mm -hmm. 
He's an artist oh. <laughs> and a curator. We curate together, oh. and he also teaches. Any questions? Oh, the humming. Yes, I forgot to even talk about the video. Thanks for reminding me about that. Um, so the video is a video that I made using um, stills. So there's like a stop action quality to it, taking a whole bunch of pictures. Um, and it's a riff off of a video that was made in the 1930s by Zora Neale Hurston called Fieldworks. Um, and Zora Neale Hurston is a novelist as well as an ethnographer um, who um, in the 1930s, she um, did some of the first films of documenting kind of black rural life. Um, in the Jim Crow South in the 1930s. And so in this, the, the video that you're hearing, all of, a lot of the imagery is a riff of, off of what was happening in that original video, except of looking at like, you know, black rural life from the 30s, you're looking at like Jessica's art life. And, um, and the humming that you're hearing is of a work song that was in the original video um, that they were singing. I'm just humming it in the background. Cool. Any other questions? Do you have a favorite piece? That's oh, hard. Favorite, <laughs> it's hard. It's really, 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 really hard because there's a lot. Um, and there's pieces that you, you kind of fall in love with for different reasons. And sometimes um, I'm like, I, with some works, I'm like, I don't want to go into commercial world. You're not going to love it like I do, you know? <laughs> so, um, but other times, you know, I, I think it's great when you're able to feel good about the work and, and um, feel connection to it. And hopefully what that does is when other people look at it, they can feel kind of that energy and vibe with it as well. All the way in the back. I'm gonna get closer to you. Make sure everyone can hear you. There you go. I just want to know what motivates you what motivates me? You know, being an artist is weird because you feel compelled to do things. I don't know if there's some soul motivate, a singular motivation for you to do things, but I feel like being an artist is kind of like being a minister or, or a, a priest or a nun. There's a calling that's involved um, in it, and there's a compulsion that's kind of there in which you feel a need um, to do it. And I think it's about being able to um, express yourself and express yourself in different modes. Um, my motivation um, in working is not just relegated though to thinking about creating an artwork. Um, my motivation is contributing to the art world and thinking about the different skill sets that you need um, to contribute to the art world in multiple ways. And so shifting from kind of like, I want to be, you know, a famous artist or supporting me to how can I contribute and make the art world more equitable or have more people be seen or be more inclusive, but contribute to the history really kind of shifted my approach to how I thought about working both um, as an artist and then the, also the different skill sets, hence the masters in arts management um, and also my curatorial practice. Oh, wow. Wait, OK. Go ahead. Thanks for the presentation. It's really great. Oh, thank you. Could you talk a little about the, um, the technique of these digital uh, outputs uh, mounted, or what, what are they? They're um, mounted on gator board. Um, they're printed. They're, it's a combination of things. So I take um, different hard copies of the archive that I've collected of different images, get them all scanned or get them into a place where I can deal with them digitally. Some things I'm taking digital photo photographs of myself. So, but the whole point is to get everything into the digital format, play with it in Photoshop, um, play with composition, building layers, et cetera, getting it to a certain point that I go then and print it out. I print it out on fine art matte paper. The fine art matte paper creates a, a, a situation where of course the surface is really matte 
Um, and so when, I'm a, when I go and then work on it with like pastel, because I go and work on the surface with it, you have the same kind of uh, textural quality of the pastel that matches the ink. Um, and the same thing with the powdered pigment. So you're really kind of playing with notions of matteness and color saturation and whatnot in the work. So once I print it, I feel like I deal with it like a painting and I just go in and tweak color, play with line and form and whatnot and deal with it kind of in a formal way with different materials. Audrey, <laughs> hello. Mm -hmm. and can like circulate on its own. So like how does it feel to have the works like gathered together and like resonating um, together as a group? Well, you know, I, I, it's funny when I uh, was asked to do this show, I was concerned, you know, about the layout and I'm like, do I have enough work? Um, <laughs> like seriously, that was my question. I was like, do I have enough work to fill the space in the way that, and I'm like, oh, my work's really tense and I have a lot. Um, and I think I, 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 you know, they are like such potent little worlds that I have, but, you know, I have like different sizes of potent little worlds that I like take in in these different scales of vignettes. So some, and then, you know, you're working in your studio or you're at home, you don't have like everything, like there's no, I couldn't walk around my house if I had everything like up at once or spread out in the living room or whatever so it's like I don't get to see how they even function or how much it's like <clears throat> like with all of them together so it's pretty like I'm still like adjusting to seeing them and like oh wow all right I'm a little compulsive but you know I, I enjoy seeing the conversation because um, the cabinet cards for me working on the smaller scale there's a, a it, it, there's a, a playfulness and a quickness and kind of sketching type of um, way that I feel that I'm able to work with it that's really playful. Where this, because of the different process involved, it's a slower process. And so working with them in ways in tandem, I really, um, it's interesting to see how they inform one another. And then also trying to kind of keep that hand of play um, in place for both the works in different scales. So it's cool to see all of this. I'm still, again, processing. I'm like, wow, this is cool. Other questions? Mm -hmm. For like any one of these panels, when you're deciding what pictures you want to bring together, is there a specific rationale between like, you know, why I'm grabbing this one and this one and putting them together? Is that more of an aesthetic choice or like a, um, what stories those two pictures bring together? Sure. So part of what I do is um, I think about a different sets of imagery that I want to represent different things. So think about going back to the like the melanin bubble again or the melanin ghosts. It's like that's something that's kind of a part of the visual language that I know that I want to take through different pieces that kind of bring forth and kind of hit home the idea because part of it, I, what I feel is interesting about seeing all this together is you start seeing, if you're unfamiliar with the work and you're taking time looking at it, you start seeing things repeat and the repetition helps to inform you about the language. It's like you don't create language unless it's repeated and you're using kind of the same words over and over again. So I have those elements that are part of it. I look at things like color gradation for skin tones that I incorporate into the work that's in relationship to kind of the melanin and the different figures. Um, I use the kind of background of the stereograph. So it's like I think of kind of a base material or template that I'm using as a resource. Um, aesthetically and then kind of different visual language that I want to keep with it so I knew I wanted to use melanin I knew I wanted to um, incorporate like the beauties of the week I know I wanted to uh, use the format of kind of the stereograph to create this longer taller type of portrait and then I start piecing things together and seeing how they work um, aesthetically, but kind of creating this conceptual framework about shifting identities and biomythography. I don't feel like I have as much struggle in terms of conceptual. It's like, okay, conceptual, it's down. Now, only thing I have to do is play with the aesthetics and how it manifests. Mm-hmm. Didn't you mention in the earlier this 
explanation? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so she was asking about the colors of the wall is, walls and why this particular color. And oh my gosh, Pam, Vivian, thank you. Because to go from an all white gallery space to this gray is so tedious, you don't even know. You have to paint it back and do like a whole new ground and then paint it multiple times to get it back to white. So thank you. But um, this gray is a significant gray because it's a gray that's used often for video work and for portraiture. And um, I wanted to make sure that I had something that looked really great with browns and sepia tones and skin tones so that not only the work would really pop, but you could be sensitive to the idea of kind of the different skin tones that are in the room. And one of the things that I noticed that I thought is so amazing in having people in this space, I'm like, everyone in here, your skin tone is represented in the work. And then on top of that, everyone looks fantastic because of this gray background. So I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yes, like let's, you know, make the brown pop. This is beautiful. So um, yeah, the gray was really specific in terms of choice and thinking about uh, the history of photography, thinking about how color um, works with skin tone, thinking about the palette that I'm using. I'm like, I chose this color, you know, on purpose for today. So can't stop there, you gotta coordinate, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, so that was the significance. Thank you for reminding me about that, the significance of the gray and how it operates. So I definitely encourage you to take pictures of each other in this space because you will look fantastic. And especially underneath the skylight because then you get a heavenly glow and it's, it's quite fantastic. Okay, other questions? You coming to get me, Pam? Thank you. I can go on forever. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, Jessica, for that. I want to thank the patrons of the arts, the School of Visual and Performing Arts, and the associated students for providing funding so that we could have this residency and have Jessica Wendley here. Without that support, all our good ideas and work would be a lot harder to accomplish. So I'm really grateful. Out front, out the front doors, we have food, we have music from a COC um, club called, what is it? Uh, hey, Hippified no. Records. Uh, yeah, Hippified Records, so they're playing a little music. I hope that you will linger. Hope, if you have more questions for Jessica, she's, as you can tell, very generous. And we'll be happy to answer them, but have a little snack and enjoy um, the victory of having a wonderful exhibition like this at COC. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. No, I actually want more than two things. I'm lying. Mm -hmm. But I would love Thank a picture you. of you uh -huh. constructed in front of some of your work. Uh -huh. And I would like a selfie together. Oh, of course. And maybe to keep in touch. Yes, yes, so yes, yes. yes. <laughs> that, right? I said. <laughs> I was like, I'm lying if I say I only want two things. So. The lady that got me into a exhibit mm -hmm. that was very uh, intense. It kind of brought me back to uh, when the... Uh, Columbus, you know, yeah, like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. really, when the Spaniards came, yeah, I really brought it back to me. Right. Like, 